Hey guys, welcome to today's webinar with PandaDoc and Insightly. Um, I'm going to be your host today, Bethany Fagan, Marketing Manager here at PandaDoc. Um, I'm going to give us a couple more minutes for some people to uh, trickle in um, while we uh, wait for those people to uh, join us. Uh, I'm going to introduce today's uh, presenters. So um, we have Jared Fuller, our VP of Sales and Business Development here at PandaDoc. Uh, Jared, go ahead, say hello, a couple things about yourself. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining in on the webinar. A uh, bit of a serial entrepreneur, owned uh, a marketing agency, and then was the CEO of JobHive, a uh, SaaS HR technology platform, and now heading up the revenue team here at PandaDoc. So really excited today to be talking about uh, these topics here with Mark. Great. Thanks, Jared. Uh, also on the line today, we have uh, Mark Ripley, VP of Sales at Insightly. Uh, welcome, Mark. Feel free to uh, jump in and introduce yourself. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So I've been selling in the technology space for uh, well over 15 years or so, carried a bag as an AE um, in a number of different companies and really uh, built a strong kind of foundation around high velocity meets high value selling and been leading teams and um, uh, organizations for the last oh, seven or so years. So today, I'm running and building out the sales team here at Insightly and excited to, uh, to share some best practices and learnings that um, I've certainly had along the way, talking with a lot of customers around uh, disorganization and how to kind of create uh, organization out of uh, the chaos of running a business. Great. Thanks, Mark. A um, couple things before we uh, dive into the conversation today, just a few housekeeping items. Um, we're going to take about 30 to 45 minutes of your time today. Um, hope you can uh, take away some key uh, points from today's webinar. Um, it is being recorded and it will be on demand uh, not only on the PandaDoc Bright Talk channel, but also the Insightly Bright Talk channel as well. Uh, we'll save some time for some questions at the end. And also be sure to check out the attachments and link sections for some additional resources from uh, PandaDoc and Insightly. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mark and uh, we can get started. All right, thanks Bethany. So we're starting this, uh, this webinar off with the most chaotic slide that we have in the whole deck. Um, but uh, you know, in all seriousness, this, this slide itself is it's a mess, right? It's a lot going on on, on, uh, on this slide. Um, so to kind of take a step back before perhaps your organization got to this step where you're seeing things flying all over the place, when you're one person, two people, three people in your company, and you have a handful of customers, you can manage that in a very straightforward way, right? But the moment that you start to have five employees, 10, 20, hundreds, the world starts to look like this slide. A lot of moving parts all over the place. And the question becomes, okay, how do you, how do you create organization and structure and a systematic process uh, with all these different moving pieces? And I imagine, right, if you mapped out your own uh, organization and how you communicate with customers, it might look very similar to this, right? Um, and, you know, my North Star is always the customer lens. And so then it's like, what does it feel like from the customer experience side of things, right? A lot of moving parts, probably delays happening here and there, steps getting missed, right? Um, and what we're here today is to really share best practices around how to, uh, to change that and ultimately give the customer a better experience um, and at the end of the day drive more revenue and help you scale. So, okay, so we're going we're gonna to take a poll here and we'll see if we can get the polling system working. Um, in a second, when the poll comes up, what we want to ask the audience is what, how is disorganization affecting you in your business? So if you could take a moment when this pops up and answer it, We'll make this interactive, and um, uh, it'd be interesting for me, too, to get a sense of uh, what's on everyone's minds. Like, what are the negative effects of disorganization in your business? Okay, looks like the poll is live. All right, starting to see some responses come in. 
Difficulty organizing information is taking the lead so far. So the top two right now from the audience are difficulty, or, difficulty organizing information is taking the lead. Number two is difficulty managing clients. Thanks everyone for jumping in and, uh, and doing the poll. We'll keep it open for a few more moments here. This is, this is fantastic. Difficulty collaborating with team members is taking third. Okay, this is great. This is, this is awesome, actually. So we'll go ahead and, um, oh, now the results are really coming in. This is cool. So why don't we go ahead and pause it now. Um, we have a good number of folks that um, have responded, and I think this will continue to trickle in. But it's interesting. So 68% of the people voting, right, the top thing was difficulty organizing information, two-thirds, right, the, the majority. Number two was difficulty managing clients, so call that 18%. So between the two, you know, talking about the vast, vast majority of the challenges affecting this audience, really grouped into those two things. And as we forward to the next slide, okay. What you'll see is um, this audience is actually very similar to uh, the poll that was um, created by a company by the name of Tech Validate. So they went out and surveyed 400, um, or actually, what, over 1,000 folks, and they really bucketed the two folks into creative professionals and then IT professionals, and really asked them, okay, so what are the biggest impacts of disorganization in your business? And it's very, it's the, the top two are the same, uh, aligned with what this audience is effectively saying, right? So organizing information and managing clients. On both sides, the top two are exactly the same, right? They're flip-flopped, but those are the two, uh, the two biggest challenges. Um, I wanted to just tell a little story uh, that kind of illustrates this, right? So I was on the phone just a couple weeks ago with an advertising media company out of Milan in Italy. Um, and so they're, they're describing this very same process, right? 35 employees, um, you know, it's really difficult for them to organize all the information. They have multiple people touching each client and things are slipping between the cracks. It's hard for them to really um, gain kind of control of the situation. And what was happening is their customers were starting to be affected. So I was, I was talking to him and I said, okay, so, but, who, but why does this matter? Like what's the business impact? What are you trying to achieve by solving this? And he answered me clear as day straight away. He said two things, Mark. One, right now when I scale my business, I have to continue to hire and hire and hire because we're not efficient. So our goal by solving this is to be able to scale without hiring more and more people. So effectively, each person can manage more customers by being organized. So I'm like, awesome, that makes sense to me. And then number two is like revenue. So for them, they generate a lot of their business for, from their existing customers. So they're a media company. When they sign a new customer, that's when the real work starts. That's when the real revenue happens. And their very first project will dictate how much future business they get from that customer. So the example he gave me was, our first project might be to build a website. So if we build that website and we're late and we miss steps and we fail to wow the customer, that's the end of that relationship. We probably won't get more projects, right, because we're disorganized. Now, if we nail it on time, um, you know, super communicative with the customer and we wow with the results, guess what? We get a lot of follow-on business. So I share that story and, and hopefully, you know, some of you can resonate with that, resonates with you that um, that's what it's about, right? That's what this organization can help businesses do is effectively give a better customer experience and drive more revenue and scale. So everyone's here for a reason. We know we want to do it. The question is, is why is it so hard, right? Why is this organization so tough to, uh, to accomplish? Um, so first, it starts with success. Right? So, you know, if your business isn't thriving, this is not a problem, right? So the good news is it's a problem because you're thriving and you're doing something right. 
but I would argue there's two things that um, make it so hard to get orga organized, right? One is the old process that got you to where you are just doesn't scale, right? It's not working. Um, so you need to change, and change is always tricky. Number two is from the businesses that I talk to, their passion is not process, right? Their passion is whatever they're doing in their business, what's creative or advertising or manufacturing or whatever it is, that's the passion. Um, and the passion is typically not process and organization. So it's kind of a foreign concept. So it sets the stage for why this is so tricky and why it's such a pervasive uh, challenge. Jared, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to take the next section. Definitely. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit now and jump into kind of the human element of uh, disorganization. And when we're dealing with salespeople, we got to remember the, the key phrase in salespeople, and that is people. Um, so what we want to do beyond showing employees what's in it for them is, I think, really the first objective is to set the stage to create alignment. This is much more about them than it is about you, than it is about your company. Uh, and what I mean by that is you really have to measure the personal impact, that life impact, and the business impact hand in hand. We want to create goals and targets that are for uh, not just the company, but for them. And what it, why it matters is you've got to ask these questions like, what is the goal? What is our goal? And what is my goal as a sales rep? And you have to put these things in alignment to show that it's more than just hitting the numbers for them. This is about making a career. If you're spending 40 hours out of your week, right, uh, most of your waking hours over the course of a week inside of a company as a salesperson, this is a big step in making this year or this quarter a good part of your career. So we, we show employees what's in it for them. Your job as a sales leader is to become someone that is an advocate for who they are and their life, their career, their family goals. This kind of benefit of uh, shared communication where you can drive some best practices, I have a couple tips as well. Uh, something we started doing here at PandaDoc, um, you have to realize as a sales leader, you have to drive, but you have to give those outlets as well for shared communication and bringing out those best practices. So every other Thursday, we do stories from the sales floor. And these the stories from the sales floor, we're engaging every rep. I got, have about 20 reps inside of PandaDoc right now. And what we're doing is we're engaging uh, around a certain topic, for instance, how to reduce the number of no-shows to our meetings. And some of our very small business reps or even our SDRs have great feedback and they feel empowered uh, to communicate and share some of these best practices. We also do things like quarterly business reviews where we're having them share their progress. How do they feel that they're doing and sharing it in an open fashion with the rest of their team? We also have a uh, project management system for our sales operations. Uh, our reps are the front line for areas where we can improve. And you need to be able to track projects, for instance, lead deduplication, um, or whatever that project might be to help your sales reps to stop wasting time. Uh, you want to show that you care about their feedback and give them a, a formal outlet where it can be tracked so they know what's coming down the pipe in terms of you upping the ante, so to speak, with your sales operations and getting that input from front lines of uh, employees. The next thing uh, that we want to talk about is some of these more direct consequences uh, for how disorganization can affect sales. Um, most organizations don't have a consistent or documented sales process. And what that results in is that most, uh, uh, most companies actually fail. Uh, whoops, looks like our slides are bouncing around a little bit. Uh, there we go. It looks like uh, most companies, two-thirds of their sales reps, actually fail to reach their annual sales quota. That doesn't bode very well for their career, kind of tying back to the last slide. You're not actually helping your, your company, your reps, actually build a career in sales if you're missing your targets and they're missing theirs. And a lot of this has to do with them spending their core activities each year, you know, more than 50 full days away from core selling activities. And kind of the theme here is that the stagnation really equals death. It equals death of your targets, um, and worst case scenario, death of someone's career and the death of your business. Uh, you have to focus on creating a great sales um, process documenting it, getting that feedback, and creating a sales culture that really aligns everyone to 
their targets and your company targets. A lot of these sales activities as well, it's about going the extra mile. So 80% of sales occur between that second and fifth call, and sometimes even more. But we know that only 20% of these reps actually even make it ever to the third call. So what's your process like for following up with people, right, that are getting off the line? This has to be documented, clear, and shared in a fashion where the rest of the team uh, understands what their next steps are supposed to be. Setting up things like a respect contract uh, with your client at the onset of a call to guide them through the process and say, this is exactly what our sales process looks like to evaluate your use case and set up the best possible workflow or product solution for you. So that way, whenever you do have that misstep, there's clear uh, next steps for your sales rep in order to guide that conversation and take that rep to the next conversation. And, and la lastly, um, we want to talk about uh, kind of some sales culture. Um, Bethany, it looks like the slides are going backwards, not forwards. Uh, so when we're talking about, <clears throat> let's see here. Forward. All right. There we go. All right. So, Mark, I'm going to pass it back off to you to talk about what an, what an organized business looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jared. Um, so when I think about an organized business, I think, it's, I think about whether it's a sales team or a business at large, it's set up for scale, right? At the end of the day, it has systematic processes in place that are repeatable when you bring people on board, whether it's Bob or Jill or Julie doing this thing, it's going to have a consistent experience both from a customer perspective and then also from an internal perspective where you can measure um, whatever they're doing. So I, uh, I use an analogy. Um, it's probably overused internally here at Insightly, but it's a good analogy, and that is when I think about an organized business and set up for scale, I think about um, you know a recipe, right? And so it's like baking a cake. And what that cake recipe looks like takes time to figure out, right? But the goal is to ultimately understand exactly what it takes to bake that cake, right? It's two eggs, it's one cup of flour, it's a teaspoon of vanilla, it's, you know, um, a little bit of chocolate, maybe a cup of chocolate, probably have this totally wrong. Uh, you mix it up, you put it in this size pan, you put it in the oven at 300 degrees for 28 minutes and out pops a perfectly baked fluffy cake, right? That recipe... Um, that's what I think about scales, having those recipes down, clearly articulated, everyone's on the same page, and now you can systematically scale. Of course, you're going to evolve that over time, but um, that's the key. So we have a couple of points here on the slide. Um, they're leveraging technology, but they know the process. They have a central place where everyone's on the same page regarding their data and the KPIs that everyone's looking at, so it's organized and focused that way. Um, and they're really driving at building that systematic um, cake recipe and process for baking a cake. If there's any bakers out there, probably got that recipe way wrong, but uh, you get the idea, hopefully. So where does it start, right? Um, the process to build an organized internal process, right? Um, there's a lot of steps, but in my mind, there's really um, a very simple way to get started. And this is, Jared mentioned this earlier, whether it's sales goals or organization's goals, is really prioritizing what to tackle first. So in this slide, we take a look at kind of a very um, standard way to look at goals. In this case, it's SMART, so very specific, they're measurable, they're action-oriented, they're realistic, and timely, right? And this is the part that I would argue most people miss is the timely fashion. What are our priorities, what are our goals, and then what's the time frame that we're all going to drive at? Most people are goal-oriented. If you give them a specific time to get it done, they'll drive and get it done. Um, you know, Google also made famous another type of way to look at goals called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. What, however you do it is less relevant. The most important thing is it should start at the top, like Jerry was alluding to earlier, and that is whether you're a sales leader, whether you're a CEO of a, of a business, whatever it is, what are the priorities? And the way I do it is by quarter. So what are my top three priorities? I'm going to do a lot of things. But what are my top three priorities for this quarter, right? Um, and then everyone that works for me on my team has their top three priorities 
for the quarter, right, timely. Their top three priorities will align whenever possible to my top three. And then if you're running a sales organization, you have reps or you have other people, they should have their top three goals for the quarter that should align to their manager and their leader all the way up to the top, right? It's actually a really simple thing to do that's extremely high impact. And you can start to gain alignment and start to gain, um, uh, start to head down the path of creating an organization. You can't tackle everything right away. So going through this process forces you to prioritize and it also gives you calm to know that there's 10 things that I know I need to do to get organized. I'm going to tackle these three. I feel really good about it. I'll tackle three more next quarter and three more the quarter after. But all of a sudden, you create this sense of relaxation and calm, controlled, getting to a point where you want to be in terms of um, building that cake recipe and scaling. So part of part of thinking about how you're going to create structure and process within the organization, um, the best organizations that I've certainly worked with invest in the right tools. Tools in themselves will not solve it, right? But tools are absolutely a, a key part of how you can create a systematic process um, to scale your business. So the number one most important thing when you're looking at tools, hands down, without a doubt, is adoption. The tool has got to be easy to use. It's got to be liked by the organization, the people that are using it. And at the end of the day, they have to use it. It is absolutely irrelevant how many bells and whistles and how powerful a tool is. If no one uses it, you've just wasted a lot of energy and a lot of money. And guess what? You haven't advanced to your company. So always, it's got to be easy to use. And the people that will be using it need to be a part of that evaluation process and buy-in so that they really will use it and uh, advance your business uh, in the ways that you're looking for. Of course, it needs to support the goals that you've set out. Um, and along with that, we have pain points on here, but your pain points should be addressed by your top goals uh, for the quarter and then also for the year. So one of, one of the big ways that organizations, whether it's a sales team or organizations at large, um, look to tools is to really automate a lot of the systematic things that need to happen, right? So when you have, you most likely have multiple people talking to cut the same customer over the course of a time, right? And the question becomes, how do you stay organized? How do you keep all these people aligned with that customer relationship as it evolves over time? Well, the trick is time, right? You, you need to look to tools to automate a lot of the stuff that you can so that, why? So that you have more time to focus on the high value um, things with customers. And ultimately, you know, the way I look at it is continue to roll out a red carpet for every single customer. Improve that customer experience so that you can continue to generate more and more revenue um, from these customers. I'll pause here and flip it back to you, Jared. All right, appreciate it, Mark. So we're going to jump in now and talk about <clears throat> kind of my theme with talking about the human element. A big part of this is creating a great sales culture. Um, and I think the, the biggest theme for, for setting the right sales culture that I've seen is that your sales culture is going to reflect results. Uh, so teams that are underperforming, it's hard to push them to the, that next level. Uh, but teams that are overperforming, everyone tends to be happy. But there's a couple things that you need to kind of watch out for um, that you can do to drive your organization forward, whether you're currently in a slump or you're currently crushing it. Uh, the first thing to communicate is that your sales organization is the driver for new business growth. And your new business growth comes from some very uh, standard places. And this applies to whether you're selling a product, a technology, a service, you name it. And that has to go back to becoming a customer company. And I say that phrase very literally. Becoming a customer company is very different than being a product or a services company. Far too often do sales organizations create a culture where it's all about them. It's about your product. It's about your features. It's about your services. And what I want to say is that's the wrong approach. When you become a customer company, when you start to care and invest in your sales team about how they put the customer first, that is setting up their ideal workflow, that is showing them the way 
uh, of how much value the ROI um, of your product or service is going to bring to their organization. That's the mindset that you need to get your, your sales team into to start to make that shift. Um, and part of that uh, strategy, what you're going to focus on, is how you as a sales leader are going to uh, impact them. So I use the phrase as a sales leader that you should be a career maker. Your job is not to just hit the company targets, but your job is to help your reps individually hit their targets and consistently, month over month and quarter over quarter and then year over year and create some alignment and excitement about what it means to achieve quota and to achieve beyond quota, even targets. So I make some recommendations to sales leaders such as setting up some simple things like a quota club where every quarter people that reach the quota club, they make their guaranteed OTE, they get job security, um, and we'll do a, you know, a dinner, something simple. But then for the people that are overperforming, do something like a president's club uh, that's quarter over quarter with a yearly membership where you do some big things. You pay, do an all-expenses paid vacation, do a guaranteed raise, do a stock bonus if your company has stock. Um, focus on them and that you'll be their advocate for their next career move. And that if they're continually performing, you're going to try to keep them there and advance their career at the company. It's also super important to show how you have marketing support. Um, get an SLA in place with your marketing team for things like lead response time. So that if your marketing team brings you leads, you're going to handle them with the utmost care um, and drive that as part of your sales culture. Uh, it's super important as well to get that support from upper management. You have to have alignment with your executive team, you know, your COO, your CEO, your CFO, uh, that the investments that you're making and the operational support you need from operations, your team has to feel that you're all driving that bus in the same direction uh, and it's on a path to greater prosperity. And, and lastly, in order to create that right sales culture, you have to empower your team with data, good and bad. Um, Get that board up on the wall, Get, even if it's a whiteboard. Who's performing this month? And then if you can, uh, if you're a high-velocity sales organization, get those activities up. Who's making the most phone calls? Who's sending the most emails? How many touches per lead or touches per opti do you guys have? Share that information and uh, make it public where you can empower them and inspire a little bit of competition. You know, If someone's crushing the phones and their numbers are greater, that's going to inspire their peer to make those phone calls as well. Next, I want to talk a little bit about sales enablement <clears throat> because this is a topic that's getting a lot of buzz right now, but it's kind of hard to put the rubber to the road. It's a bit of a fluffy term. So really, sales enablement to me is uh, the technologies, the tools, the processes, and specifically the content that your team uses to accelerate the sales uh, process. So whenever we're talking about content, things that can help the sales team is not just a general case study. It's actually a series of case studies and content library items that are tuned for two specific things. A, the company persona. If you're selling to a medical technology company, you better have case studies that fellow medical technology companies have used your product or service and achieved results. Secondly, you want to match the buyer persona. If you're selling to the VP of marketing at the uh, medical technology company, then you want to have how this VP of marketing has looked good to their organization, how they've bettered their business. Um, so that content needs to be tailored to not just the company, but also to the persona. And remember, the reason why this is so important is because champions don't sell for you. You might get someone in the organization who's really happy to be talking to you, but at the end of the day, you probably have other decision makers involved in that process. So if you're delivering this content, it's a way for you to get the right information in front of other decision makers in the organization uh, that can help educate them prior to, let's say, a closing conversation, whereas you've been working with a champion, and at the last second, you're talking to a decision maker. Sales teams that are better equipped with the right content can ensure that that content is delivered and disseminated throughout the process prior to jumping into that conversation. You have to ensure effectiveness of this content. Uh, measure what's being sent, what's being opened over time. Um, if reps aren't using certain case studies or you notice that certain verticals aren't performing the same, adapt. Invest in other content. Invest in other personas. Continue to iterate to ensure the effectiveness of this content. Because at the end of the day, your goal is to maximize the selling time with the key decision makers. 
And the more influential your content and the more personalized that content to them, the more time you're going to be able to command of theirs, be it on a phone, a demonstration, a follow-up, a workflow consultation, you name it. And lastly, I would add, so what you want to do is make your sales reps famous. It's so important to not just put a case study together or a content library item that talks about the company and the buyer, but also how your rep helped this person. Feel free to name drop in these case studies. This is how Josh helped company X achieve Y results. Trust is something that's far underlooked in the sales enablement process. Marketers and marketing teams and sales leaders should do a lot more to, to where you're asking for case studies, you're getting these case studies, um, but they're also being written from a perspective that the rep themselves was a trusted advisor, almost a consultant, is a part of the success. And lastly, um, <clears throat> in terms of measuring success, to determine what's working and what's not, you need to take an iterative approach to this kind of sales enablement content. Um, there's a couple cool tricks. Um, there's a lot of tools and technology out there where you can actually see um, how many pieces of content are being delivered, but even how long are people staying on each page. We're not talking about putting together a 20-page you know, magnum opus on your company. Keep things concise. See where people are zeroing in and try to reflect those changes across other pieces of content in your deck or in your case studies or in your proposals. Uh, make continual improvement to these things. It is an iterative process. Because um, you want to continue to optimize content um, and continue to get new content. So a part of what my sales organization does is we're always closing, of course, ABC, always be closing, but we're all, always closing for new content as well. So these are case studies and referenceable clients that we ask at the end of a closing conversation. Uh, and we ask hard for that, not only their business, but also for that case study. If uh, my rep can ask them specific questions how they were helpful in the sales cycle, and that they're willing to be a referenceable client for other people. Because if you can say, hey, here's how we sold to medical uh, technology company X and this VP of marketing, and she's willing to get in the conversation with you um, if you'd like to speak with them. Now, nine times out of ten, they're not going to pick you up on this. They're not going to say, hey, yes, I want to talk to that client. But your willingness to do so demonstrates a far level greater of commitment to their success than merely saying, oh, here's a nameless case study, right? Put some faces, some names, and some potential introductions uh, to help that rubber meet the road. And lastly, uh, to kind of wrap everything together that Mark's been talking and I've been talking about, you want to make sure you're looking at the right data uh, for sales organization. Here's some of these key metrics for success. You need to look at leads over time, uh, or what's commonly referred to in the Valley as lead velocity rate. Is the amount of leads that you're bringing in, the marketing qualified and the sales qualified leads, increasing month over month? Do you have an upward trajectory? Do you have a downward trajectory? Get in alignment with your marketing team on what the, not just how many leads you get per month, but what is that lead velocity rate? That's going to impact your hiring plan, and that's going to impact how many reps you need uh, to have a full you know, belly month over month. Of course, your marketing team is going to care a lot about lead response time. What's your lead to opportunity conversion ratio? If you have way too many leads at the top of the funnel and you're creating too few opportunities, you might want to back off and focus on quality versus quantity. Uh, of course, things like net new opportunities, um, win rates, but also the win-loss reports. The goal here is to uh, you know, understand the stage of the loss. You want to be able to kill deals earlier in the cycle. Um, so you're not wasting time with deals that end up falling off at stage four when you know it's a bad fit at stage two. The more conversations you have with a lost deal, the more costly that loss ends up becoming. Um, and overall, measure the length of time from you know, discovery to closure uh, and so on. So let's, uh, let's wrap things up here today. I want to talk a little bit about our kind of key takeaways that Mark and I just kind of talked about. You have to have clear goals and objectives, not just for your company, not just for your sales team, but for individual teams and for the reps themselves. What does it mean to achieve um, the bare minimum? What does it mean to achieve greatness? Celebrate these wins. Empower your team. You have to invest in the right tools. Um, and this comes from you know, data consistency in your sales process, like CRM, all the way to the type of content uh, and closing collateral that you're putting in to seal the deal right, and influence buyers on their buyer journey. 
And automation is the name of the game in 21st technology sales, and it applies to service businesses. It applies to uh, you know, manufacturing companies. Whatever it is, you need to automate as much as you can to focus and maximize selling time, not just activity taking, right? Writing down uh, you know, how many calls you made. Your CRM and your sales process should be able to automate most of those manual dirty tasks that sales reps hate to do. You can't uh, you know, underemphasize the importance of creating a sales culture. Um, focus on your reps. Be a career maker. Show that your job is for them to walk away from this job saying, I made my job under this person's leadership at this company. I created a career this year. That should be your New Year's resolution for 2017. And if you're implementing sales enablement, uh, putting the right content in place, um, always ensure that you're measuring the success of your process to get out of this disorganization. Um, and I would say to always continue to evaluate and raise the bar because uh, that's your job as a sales leader is to consistently move the needle upwards and create that culture of sales excellence and uh, create some, you know, organization from the chaos of running a small to medium-sized business as you're growing quickly. Um, so uh, I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you guys so much for attending the webinar. It sounds like we have a few uh, questions from the audience. Um, so let's uh, jump into some questions. So awesome. Thanks, off, Jared. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, okay. yeah, take it away. If you can see, if you can see some questions there, too. <clears throat> um, I'll, uh, I'll pass one off to um, Mark. So, Mark, what are some ways you can get everyone bought in on the team versus the Lone Ranger closing? I think we've all seen that. One guy that's killing it, but the rest of the guys can't, you know, uh, turn the needle. What would your suggestion be? Yeah, so um, – there's a couple things. One is if you have people absolutely crushing it, first off, good news, right? Great news. Then the question becomes like, how do you how do you unravel that and then replicate that? Um, this this question, I am interpreting as um, the age old. You have some people and salespeople, like a lot of them have egos, right? So they're crushing it. They are you know the the big dude or dudette uh, on campus and they're absolutely crushing it. Um, they don't need help. Right, um, or even like maybe it's someone that's doing okay, or someone's struggling, but just not comfortable really um, working with their manager or working with their resources to um, jump into the sales process. So I'll tell you um, one common mistake that I've seen is from sales managers and leaders is um, not promoting um, the reps enough and their success. And this sounds like a really simple thing, but it's amazing how often I've seen it is like when there is a win and the sales manager was involved in it, it's a we won, right? And that's not the case. We did not win, right? Your rep won, your AE won. Really important to constantly um, put them up on the pedestal so that they feel comfortable bringing people in and knowing that it's still their, it's still their deal. If they're the quarterback, they're rolling with it. Um, as sales leaders, we are overhead, right? By definition, our roles are really to support the AEs and continue to put them on, on pedestals. So that's one thing. And then the other facet um, is, you know, getting to the heart of why. If someone's not comfortable bringing in their manager or bringing in other people into their cycles, there's a reason why. And that reason why is often individual and unique to that person. So I would first look to unravel that, right? So why is, you know, Bill uncomfortable bringing people in and why does he keep wanting to go on it himself? So if you can figure that out, then you're in a position to solve it. But at the end of the day, um, you know, win together, lose together, but don't lose alone, right? That's that's really the message. Definitely. I think, uh, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. And the more you can do to, you know, get those best practices out in the open and document, um, I think this kind of goes into the next question as well. Um, there's actually three things you need to do uh, that I believe. So I'll, I'll say these three things and I'll dive into each one. Uh, this answers the other question. How do you keep sales teams using the right content? So I would say document, train, and coach. That's your focus. So the first thing you need to do is document where in the sales process are you delivering collateral, where is it stored, and how is it being delivered, right? So we talked about company personas and buyer personas. So once we've hmm. identified that in the cycle, we're going to deliver, right, this company uh, information and this persona information. That could be an information uh, packet. It could be a proposal. It could be you name it. And then you're going to train your sales organization. 
So you document the process. Here's where you get it, team. It's in one sales playbook. Then you go to training where you do a bi-monthly or even monthly training session where you're talking about your sales process and how you're improving it um, and addressing individual questions. The last thing is going to be coaching, and this is where I recommend some strong call coaching, right, where you're sitting on um, – and building a customer journey from A to Z, a lot of sales managers will jump into random calls, but they don't tie together a string of calls from the first discovery conversation to the closing conversation. So when I say coach, what you want to do is identify, okay, we had a four-call cadence for this deal, right? After call two, we should have went really strong on the proposal and included as a part of that the case study that talks to this buyer persona, right, and this company persona. So what you can do over time is identify where in the cycle it's most effective to deliver the collateral and why. And what I'd like to add as a, a, a final piece there is every time you're giving something to a client, you have the opportunity to ask for something. So a lot of sales reps don't like sending collateral because some people will just ask for collateral and then they'll go dark. It's a great opportunity to say, hey, Joe, I'm happy to send you this information, but I'm going to ask that we go ahead and set up the next call with you know, Suzanne and Jeff, so that way we can make an informed decision together. So I'm going to copy Suzanne and Jeff on this piece of collateral, and then we're going to set that time for next Tuesday at 9 a.m. How does that sound to you? It's an opportunity to use content uh, to give something to the client to get something back, setting that next step or that expectation. Uh, looks, yeah. like, looks like we had another uh, question come in in response to that last statement. What do you do when the heavy hitter of the team doesn't want to share, you know, his or her strategy to level up the team, uh, and they really want to keep it to him or herself? Uh, I think that goes to a culture issue, Mark. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, it absolutely is, right? In, you know, in an ideal world, you want everyone – this is an ideal world, right? This is not easy to get to, but you want everyone really comfortable sharing both what's working for themselves and – here's the key, right? And what's not working, right? And so – there's a lot of different things that you can do to get to that point, but that's the ultimate end goal. I'm really, really proud to say that, you know, last week we lost a deal to one of our competitors, and the rep sent out an email to the entire sales team explaining why, right? That's awesome. As a leader, that is so beautiful in sharing where they skin their knee and stub their toe so everyone can benefit, right? So that's the ideal state is when everyone feels comfortable and they know they're not going to be judged and everyone's in it together working toward that common goal. So if there's people that um, are uh, you know, not willing um, to share what's working for them, there's typically a reason for that. Maybe, you know, maybe it's hyper-competitive environment, um, and maybe that is by design. You know, everyone builds their environment a little different. But um, you know, typically there's a reason why, uh, if you can get to the heart of that, and then you can start to solve that. But it's really, in my mind, I've had a lot of success building a very focusing on support, focusing on highlighting when people do things well. When things don't go well, obviously start shouldering that blame as a leader, right? So it's really, it's really fostering a culture where people feel supported, where they feel comfortable sharing these things, um, and they're going to be appreciated and uh, not ridiculed or judged. So I would add to that, it's probably time for a very serious conversation with that rep where you start to talk about things uh, literally about creating a sales culture that you guys expect in your organization uh, and creating that culture of sales excellence. And one of the ways to make them look really good, and that's what it's about, you want to make them look good because they're crushing it, is to say, hey, you're making good money because you keep crushing your goals. We're going to really start to prioritize as a team some team goals. So, for instance, I just took the entire PandaDoc sales team to Las Vegas for our end of year, um, celebrating our end of year goals for hitting our team goals, our targets, and for uh, doing our sales kickoff. Now, I'm not saying you got to go to Las Vegas, but you should have some near-term things where you say, hey, look, Rep X, you're killing it. But we have to create the culture that we want to be a part of. And these kids are looking up to you. These guys and gals are looking up to you. And if they aren't hitting their target, we're not going to be able to hit our team goal. So everyone's going to be looking to you this month as a leader, as a figurehead. I would say have a heart-to-heart -heart with them um, and say, look, we set this team target. If you hit your number, you're going to get paid, but the rest of these people aren't. Let's bring out the culture that we want and not just focus on your number, but let's focus on that team number and incentivize them. Put a perk on top of it. If we hit our team goals this quarter, you know, and you're a big part of that, I'm going to do X for you. Um, 
and then, you know, explain the alternative. You know, if our sales team keeps on going down and you keep on being the Lone Ranger, the health of this business, we're all at risk. Just because you're hitting your quota, but other people aren't, we all might lose our jobs. And if you're not a part of helping fix that solution, then you're probably, you know, let's say you're at the wrong company. Um, but I, I would definitely say it's time for a heart to heart with that rep. Great. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions. Bethany, did we have uh, anything else? No, I think that takes care of it for, for today. Uh, it looks like we got one last minute question there, Jared. All right. So any experience in working with independent sales reps versus in-house sales reps? Uh, I believe they should be, should, they should be the same, but are looking for uh, field uh, for feedback. So I'm not sure what that means, independent sales reps. So this looks like outsourcing sales potentially versus uh, in-house sales reps. Mark, maybe you can take a first stab at this one. Yeah. It, in my interpretation, it probably means one of two things, right? So an independent sales rep might sell, sell a variety of products. So they might sell, you know, 10 different products from 10 different companies. So you're really trying to fight for a piece of their attention and enable them and inspire them to focus on your product, number one. Or number two, independent sales rep could be someone that you're just paying commission only. And so they're an independent contractor and, and you just build a relationship with them. So they, um, everything they sell, you're just paying them strict commission. So either way, right, I also, uh, in this question, it says the uh, um, person that asked, I believe they should be the same, but I'm looking for feedback, and I would absolutely agree, right? So they should be uh, seen as an extension of your own sales team. Um, they should feel like that, right? They should feel empowered. So when you do trainings, when you roll out a new case study and you train your team, like Jared was talking about, or you roll out a new piece of content, they should absolutely be invited. If you're doing role plays, they should be a part of it, right? Um, and then the one difference I would say is if you're working with an independent sales rep, like a manufacturer rep that's selling, you know, a bunch of other products. So your goal is to try to get mind share, right? Your goal is to try to get them focused on what you're selling and inspiring them. So you really want to think through how to do that and how to inspire them. Sales reps, there's no doubt, right? We all know that, um, you know, we're focused on how we're going to make money. So ideally you have an answer to that question of how, they, when they sell your product, they can make more money and more commission short term and then also long term. So if you can whip that up into a story and then independent sales reps typically need a simplified process, right? Because they're selling a bunch of products, so you got to simplify it. So it's got to be hard hitting. It's got to be simple. Ideally, you can spoon feed them with what vertical, maybe an account list, whatever it is. You can make it really simple and then you can make it so that they can um, earn uh, a good commission off what you're doing. And uh, in my experience, if you can get that right, um, you can, depending on how many independent sales reps you have, you can scale that and you can, you can grow quickly. Definitely, Mark. I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, PandaDoc has hundreds of channel resellers. So we have a whole bunch of outside organizations that are reselling our product. And I think that applies just the same as a channel or, you know, an independent sales rep. I think that's some great feedback. It sure does. Yep. Well, that looks like it's it for today, uh, gals and guys. Thank you so much for uh, tuning into our presentation. Make sure that you uh, check out the attachments and links section. Um, we also have, uh, you know, some follow-up resources from both Insightly and from PandaDoc. So check that out in the Bright Talk channel uh, or follow the links on the screen uh, as you see them there. So thank you again. Thanks, Mark and Jared. Appreciate your time today. Great content. For sure. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. Thank you.